morning. Church, let's stand up your feet this morning. Let's sing together. assembled by his hand what compares to his power to the greatness he commands everything that has been everything that is to come answer to one the holy one give the praise for all he's done Whoa. God is unrivaled. Whoa, His word is still final. The empires rise and empires fall. The King of all kings is still on His throne. Whoa, our God is, our God. All our hope, our salvation was established in His name. What compares to His glory, to the greatness of His reign. Everything that has been, everything that is to come, answer to one, the Holy One, give a praise. Jesus, you came 
chalked a crown of thorns. As long gave way to liberty and freedom for humanity with the grace of
up the name of Jesus and we praise you and honor you and just worship you this morning. We thank you for your love. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross. Lord, we remember during this time, during this holiday, the, the importance of Jesus coming down to live amongst us, to dwell amongst us, and to teach us and to ultimately die for us. We thank you. Thank you. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Kids 12 and under can go to Kids Church this morning. It's good to have some people back from this virus. Some are still struggling, but we'll pray for all of them. Amen. We just pray for them. And if you're here, you might be a COVID survivor. That's what my mom tells me. We are COVID survivors. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That is right. A couple, two, three announcements. Next Sunday, our Christmas services, normal times, A and sorry, nine. Don't come at eight. You can come at eight and drink more coffee. A 9 in English, 10, 30 in English, and 12 in Spanish. And one another announcement, and this is going to be something that I just want to say from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I have never prayed so hard for Thursday nights. In the last two Thursdays, we can see that we are in a desperate need. Uh, I am praying and praying and praying, God, help us send us more people to help Thursdays because we don't have to say, God, send them more kids, because we have a lot of kids here. But I'm going to beg you with all my heart to think and consider coming and helping us Thursday. We really can use some more teachers. We really can use some security. Uh, in fact, we got to the point that we're going to have to lock those doors back there, so we don't have to have another spot that the kids can get in trouble. You have to understand, the, the kids that come Thursday, they not, sorry, this is the hard one. The kids that come Thursdays are not perfect and nice like your kids and you when you were a little kid. A lot of them are just coming from homes that are not very um, disciplined and stuff like that. And so we really, 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 I have never prayed. I've been in this for almost 21 years in this church doing Thursday nights. And I have never prayed and be so desperate and so worried about can we bring all these kids? Because we need more teachers. We need more security. If your two eyes work and you can see kids, that would be a great help. We need more drivers for vans. We have three vans, but we have two vans. And sometimes we have to just ask people to take them home. And I think more than once we have thrown more kids than we should be throwing in there because they have to go home. And so think about it. I know you have your favorite show to watch a Thursday night and whatever you do. But about all the seven nights of the week, could you maybe come and help us Thursday nights? We could use you no matter what you are doing. And, and this is one of the kids. It's one of the things that if you come Thursday nights, it's a ministry that is going to challenge you, it's going to push you. If you can get mad quick like your pastor... This is a good opportunity to come and, and temper yourself. And so I'm not going to say anything more, more than this. Jesus said, I came to serve. So please, we need you to help us. Thursday night is the biggest outreach we do. And also don't forget, Wednesday, 22nd Christmas, worship night at 6.30. We're going to have a wonderful Christmas worship night in this place. Wednesday, 22nd at 6.30. It's going to be powerful. Open your Bibles. Go to your Bibles to uh, Matthew 
chapter 5. We're going to take a break for next week, Christmas services. But we're going to finish this series after Christmas, <laughs> because next Sunday is our Christmas services. Matthew 5, 9. And Jesus said, this is the seven beatitude. He said, blessed, I will put my eyes on you. I'll bless you, bless you, bless you. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. I ask you to help me to communicate this word. I ask you, Lord, because this is such a huge subject. One of the biggest struggles we ever had, maybe now more than any time in history, the lack of people who brings peace in the middle of wars, in all the arenas of our lives, God. Lord, I ask you that you would make us Christians to be not like the world. The people will say what you say here, Jesus, that is a son of God. That is a daughter of God. That is a true Christian. Because look how big of a peacemaker this person is. Your word says people is going to call us your sons and your daughters. Because they see the signature of Jesus, the greatest peacemaker that ever, ever lived. Father, we ask you to speak to our lives today. And we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody says, amen. If you're sitting next to your spouse or somebody in your house, you might, if I ask you, are you a peacemaker? And most of you say, yes. But what about you let that person next to you tap in my knee twice if you think I'm a peacemaker, you know? That might change the whole understanding of if you are a peacemaker or not. But the older I get, the more I live, the more I try to help families, marriages, and people, young people, the more I think, man, this home could really use one or two great peacemakers. What is a peacemaker? It's a person that makes, brings, creates peace. Amen? And peace is not created Generally, in a peacetime, you know, you're not a peacemaker because you just invited your spouse to a nice day to her favorite restaurant. And she said, yes, and we are so peaceful and we are so happy. The one question that I know that Katie's never going to say no is, did you want to go out to eat? She will never say no to that. I have learned that. 25 years of marriage. But... I can tell you there is other things that if I say, she will say, don't say that. That's when the fight starts. And Jesus says here, the world will call you my sons. People, your family, your spouse. See, it's easier for me to be a pastor than to be a father and a husband, I tell you, it's so much easier, even with the challenges that has ministry. Because that, a home, is where the rubber meets, what? The road. That's where people really knows you. And it's interesting that this is the beatitude number seven, and in the Bible, seven represents Perfection. And so when I say, are you a peacemaker, I have to ask you, did you bring peace last time that somebody was creating a little war at work, in school, at church, at home, in the kitchen? Did you bring peace in that situation? But it's interesting because the beatitude before of blessed are the peacemaker, Jesus said, blessed are those who are what? Pure in heart. Do you think there is a coincidence there that the Christian who is fighting strongly against 
Everything that is ungodly in their life, because that is a pure of heart person. I didn't say that last Sunday, but I, 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 I just want to tell you, because Jesus says first, you got to pursue purity of heart. If you let anything that you want to watch, say, think, or do, just do, think, and say, and watch, you're not going to be a person that is pure in heart, amen, because you are not fighting against ungodliness in your life. And so I'm challenged myself because when I have to preach, I have to think, and the Holy Spirit brings those things. And this last week, I'm telling you, there was a few times that the Holy Spirit said, with that show, what do they say in TV? Is that conversation? Is that thought? Is that purity of heart? And I had to get stuck on my tracks. More than once I wanted to say something that would bring glory to me. I'm telling you. I was just wanted to say something. Say, uh-uh, you're trying to speak really well about yourself. And the Holy Spirit is saying, purity of heart? And being cocky? Or being prideful? Or wanting to tell others that you're doing better than them? Or do you do more than them? And so... The more purity of heart that you and I can have in our lives, listen, the more peacemakers we can be. Think about that. The more sin you entertain, the more buttons you will have, the more carnal you will be, and the more people can make you mad, and you will engage in the war. Because being a peacemaker is a very, very spiritual thing. It's a very spiritual thing. And Jesus says almost like, you have achieved perfection here in this one. You become a peacemaker. How was your, how, how much peace was in your mind the last time the things did not win your well, your way? When things don't go your way, what did that create inside of us? A war, an internal war. We get mad, we get angry, we get frustrated, we say stuff. And so, the pure in heart is fighting against ungodliness in their life. They fill their life with the presence of God, with the word of God. But make no mistake, there is a difference in between being a peacemaker and a pacifist. There's another word that is related to that pacifist. What is a pacifist? Jesus doesn't say, blessed is the peacemaker. Because he was a peacemaker, but he brought fire into this world. The pacifist is a person that will never say or do anything. Because they don't want to confront anything. But the peacemaker is a person that brings peace when somebody is bringing war against them. And it's not that they're not going to deal with that. They will deal with that, but in a peaceful way, maybe in five hours or maybe in five days when the engines are cold again. You know what I'm saying? How many of you guys have really fix things in your relationships in a war fighting warrior attitude screaming yelling calling names attacking this other person diminishing the person the next person remembering the past embarrassing have everybody fixed anything like that we don't fix nothing like that that's what jesus says Blessed are the peacemaker. In a hard time, in a war time, the pacifist says nothing and he will never say anything. But the peacemaker rather gets smack than smack someone else. Have you ever been smacked with somebody's words? There's a saying that is not in the Bible, sticks and stones will hurt me, something like that, will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. 
How many of you guys, somebody has said something, just said something, and it really hurts you? Really, really, really hurts you. And when we are not peacemaker, some of us knows what are those words that we have to say. It is not nice, but we can use those again and again. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Be angry and do not sin. We know the story of Cain and Abel, the two sons of Adam and Eve. They're all going to offer it. Both of them are going to offer it. Offer an offering to God, and Abel brings the offering, and God is pleased with the offering, and Abel, and Abel, and then Cain, and God is not pleased with him, and Cain gets really, 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 really mad at his brother. You probably know the story, you know, the first murder in the Bible. And what does God says to Cain? Why are you so angry? Be careful, because sin is right there, standing on the threshold at the door of your heart and your mind. It's okay to get angry, but the peacemaker has the power of the Holy Spirit, the wisdom, the understanding to not sin. Anybody here has sin being angry? Have you ever sinned when you get being angry? How many of you guys have with me seen many, many times when you got angry? Many, many times. Did you know that there is guys and ladies in jail for the rest of their lives, 40, 50 years, just because they got angry in a moment and committed a horrible crime? Because there, this is no joke, my friends. That's why the Bible says the world will know that you are a son or a daughter of God. <laughs> because you know how to control your anger, your madness. Be angry and do not sin. And then it says, and do not let the sun go down on your wrath. I tell you, I don't know how you are. But when I have not forgiven or how God speak to me when somebody really offended me. Do you know what happened to me when I go to bed that night? And I'm leaning there. I'm thinking. First I think on the horrible thing that that person said or did. The next thing the devil puts in my mind. Something not godly, nasty, immoral, mean, vengeful to do. Against that person. Anybody is like me. Like, you're that horrible of a person, you know. Like, just so you go pastor. <laughs> That's why the Bible says, do not let the sun go down. Because when you don't fix, and then you wake up 2, 3 in the morning, and you keep dragging that. And I heard a wife one time say, five days later, I don't even remember what he did or said, but I'm still not talking to him. The sun went down and went down and went down. And then it says, verse 7, one of the, 27, one of the shortest verses in the Bible, nor give place to who? Nor give place. Can we all say it together? Nor give place to the devil. Where did this starts? It's okay to be angry. And it ends, don't give place to the devil. Don't give place to the devil. The peacemaker embraces peace and does not engage in war. My first point was, I didn't say it, for the peacemaker, there is never a bad time of peace 
or a good time of war. Think about that. Maybe now you understand my point. For the peacemaker, not the pacifist. Okay, the pacifist is never going to deal with it. The peacemaker, that it, for the peacemaker, there is never a good time of war. And never a bad time of peace. The peacemaker stands strongly and says, I am not going to make this war continue. I am not going to let this fight get bigger. I am not going to be part of making this war worse. Are you here with me? I am not going to let the devil use me as one of his pawn in this fight or in this argument with my spouse, with my kids, with my boss. I heard this week about somebody who said, who went to ask for some days off to his boss. Nobody here is not somebody in Benalillo. And the boss didn't give him the, all the time, the two weeks, just give him one week. And this person said, I almost punch in the face my boss. Probably this person uh, has the right to two weeks. I don't know what the, the problem was. Now, how would that end up? You try to punch your boss in the face. Let's see where is that going to take you. Then he's going to say, okay, you just make me bleed. You just got me a black eye. You can have a month off. You think that's going to happen? It's maybe the last thing that guy is going to do in that room or in that building or in that, <laughs> or in that job. So that takes me to my second point. Can you give up your rights? Yes, can you give up your rights and still be a winner in the eyes of God? Because you cannot be a peacemaker if you don't decide to give up your rights. Are you following me here? Wait a little bit, Pastor. I'm the first one who goes to all the fighting for the right marches, but I'm not talking so much about what the world is doing. I'm not saying that there's a lot of injustice, and I'm not getting into the political arena. I'm talking about you as a Christian, you as a mom, you as a husband, you as a father. How many of you guys are happy you're going to heaven? Can I see your hands now? Did you know why you and me can go to heaven? Because our Lord Savior gave up to all his rights. And news flash for the husbands, the Bible says in Ephesians, I believe, chapter 4, that we have to love our wives. <laughs> oh, you, you, are you really going to say that, Pastor? Yes. As Christ loved, who, who? The church. And then it says right after that, and gave up his life for her, for her bride. We live in a world that is becoming more and more and more worse. And the Bible says, listen, the Bible says that in the last days, we're going to see like never before, kids against parents, parents against kids, spouses against spouses, and the whole world fighting against everybody. I'm going to say a, a common phrase, and let's see how you finish it. Then I'm going to play with that a little bit. I saw a sign that in Albuquerque. Maybe if you say it, you're not going to say it. You saw it, but you're not going to say it. But have you heard this saying, 50% of marriages end up in? Have you, say, have you heard that before? I'll say one more time. 50% of marriages end up in what? In? Divorce. The other day I told Katie, I saw a sign in Albuquerque that says, 50% of marriages end up in marriages. 
Remember last Sunday? Your nature establishes how you see things. The raven and the dove flying in the same sky. One sees a dead animal to eat. The other one sees the cornfields. <laughs> because the nature of the dove and the nature of the raven. And so what am I saying here? I'm talking about the 50% of marriages don't end up in marriage because they have it all perfect or they never fight or they never think different. We can have amazing relationships in our lives. We can have amazing, listen, I can tell you this, and I'm not trying to sound something that is not real. You can have an amazing marriage. You can have the most amazing marriage that you ever imagined. You can have amazing kids, not perfect kids, but you can have kids who love you and love you and you love them back. And you can have marriages that you love and they love you back. It is possible because 50% of marriages end up in what? In marriage. But let me take you to a story in the Bible of a father who had a lot of rights. And you know the story. The Bible says Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. And in the culture and in the law said that when the father dies, that's when the father splits up the capital, the inheritance, the money, sells everything or however he divides his, his properties and stuff. And then when he dies, what happens? He gives it to the son. You know? that's, that was the, what happened in that culture. And Jesus said that this man who had a lot of servants, a lot of money, a lot of land, a lot of animals. He had two sons. The youngest son told the father, and it seemed like the guy was very young. He tells his father, Father, give me. He doesn't say, will you please? Can you make an exception? He says, Father, he demands for the father to give up on his rights. Give me half of the inheritance. Amen. That's what the Bible says. And the father gave him half of the capital. He could have used it for maybe 20, 30 more years to make a lot more money, whatever happens. And the son goes and squanders his money in sin. And then he has no money. A famine comes to the land where the son is. He gets, cannot get a job, gets the worst of the jobs, taking care of pigs. And he's so hungry that he wants to eat the food of the pigs, which is a vine. It's really, it says the algarrobas is a vine that grows in a tree that is a very bitter, bitter thing that pigs eat, but it's a horrible thing, uh, uh, thing to eat. And he desires that. And he comes to his senses and he says, I'm going to go back to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against you. Just please make me one of your servants so I can have a, all the bread that I can eat. And he goes back, and the father doesn't say nothing. You, this, and you, that. The Bible says that the father embraces him, puts him a ring, puts sandals, clothing, throws a party for him. Listen, the father gave up all his rights a few months or a few years before this point. Yes, he gives up all his rights. He couldn't say uh-uh, I'm not doing that to you. That could be an injustice to your brother because if I keep that money, I'll reproduce it more and I will have more when I die and your brother will get more, but now it's just this amount and we can go into all the making sense of fighting for his rights. But what would happen if the father would say that? Either he has a kid that runs away, mad at him, and maybe never comes back, or he would stay there with this prideful, selfish, disrespectful, and blah, blah, blah. You can say, put all the words that you want there. None of us want to have a kid like that. No, none of us. But what does the father gets back? Get, gets back the most amazing son that he had ever had before. So can you give up your rights and still be a winner in the eyes of God? Yes, and also in the long Run, listen to me.
If that wouldn't be godly, Jesus would never lose all his rights to die for you. Pastor, you really say, yes, I'm talking about this. The ungodliness messes up everything. The prodigal son in the father represents God. The father loses all his rights and he gets back a wonderful son. The son now for the rest of his life <laughs> is humble, is repented, just wants to eat, wants to work there as a servant, doesn't care where he sleeps, doesn't care what he gets. He just wants to have a bed and bread to be happy for the rest of his life well, I'm going to go a little deeper I know I didn't say this in the first service but I'll say in the second service there are many many marriages that when one did something wrong and the other one would have given up their rights and forgiven they could have the best marriage that they ever had before but that didn't happen Think about that. I didn't tell you, you can have a wonderful marriage just to sound like we have a good marriage. I told you this because I'm going to be honest, there is a lot of forgiveness that happened in my relationship with Katie. A lot. Probably way more than you have ever, ever thought about But I know that we love now each other so much more than the day that we got married. I, I know that. The Bible says in Mark chapter 4, and when we read this story, I want you to think not in a physical way, but in a spiritual, in an emotional, in a relational way. Here is the disciples, they have Jesus in their lives, but Jesus is sleeping in the boat. And if Jesus is not sleeping in the boat in your life today, he's speaking to you. Because the gospel is the only thing that can fix any problems in this world. Do you hear what I said? The gospel is the only thing they can fix all the problems in this world. And it should start with us, the Christians. And here is Jesus in Mark 4, 37. And a great wisdom windstorm arose. Any been in those? In the kitchen, in the car, at work, in school? A great windstorm arose. And the waves beat it. There is violence now. Physical, emotional, verbally, mentally, waves beating into the boat so that it was already feeling this boat is going to sink. That's what the Bible is saying. This marriage is going to sink. This relationship with your kid is going to sink. This church is going to sink. This job is going to sink. This friendship is going to sink. The water is filling the boat. But he, Jesus, is on the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him. There is no more peace. There is not one peacemaker that I can see here until Jesus wakes up. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? It is not like, how can you say this in a nice way? Can you tell your wife, Honey, in a nice way, you don't care that I'm doing all the cooking and cleaning and picking up by myself. Can you say that in a nice way? Can you even say that? No, you cannot say that. You, even if you're like an angel, you cannot say those words in a peaceful, nice way. There was another lady who said the same thing to Jesus. You don't care? That I'm doing all the work and my sister is doing nothing. You know the story, Martha and Mary? <laughs> and I have to feed you and all the 12 ones. And you guys are a bunch of machistas. And you guys don't cook. And you guys don't help. And you guys don't do anything. 
And the lady said, don't you care? They have to do all the work. And she's just there sitting, listening to you, Jesus. And this disciples here, no, there is no a nice peacemaker way that you can tell your, even your kids, you don't care, Hans, that I'm always the one doing this. And you never help me. And they say, you don't care. There is no more peace in the boat. You don't care that we are perishing. It's like me telling Katie, honey, you don't care that you are killing our relationship? <laughs> How would that sound? No? You don't care that you are about to kill me? They are mad. There is a storm going on inside of them. He arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, you and I need to learn that. Rebuke the wind. How many of us, if you would be Jesus, you would rebuke the guys who are yelling to you first? Anybody with me here? Can I see a hand or two? Shut up! Be quiet. Everybody go over there. You know what I'm saying? Shut up. Stop yelling at me. I do care. You start defending yourself, huh? You don't care. Because you did this. Remember 52 hours ago in 13 seconds? Am I talking reality here? Any peacemaker or not peacemaker in the room now? <laughs> the Bible says he gets up and he rebukes the wind. And he rebukes the storm. Do you know what I see here? When somebody throws the war against you, you and I need to tell our own emotions and minds, shut up, and don't tell the other person, shut up. And start defending yourself. And the house is still on fire. And now you are fighting like a cat and a dog. He rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. Peace, be still. Anybody can use that self-talk once in a while? Peace, be still. Can anybody use that self-talk? Peace, be still. Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. Wait a little bit. He hasn't said nothing to the disciples who are yelling at him, being disrespectful, calling him he don't care, and throwing all kinds of accusations. He hasn't said one thing yet. Is Jesus a peacemaker? Oh, yes, you know he is. <laughs> Peace be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. In Spanish, the King James 1960, I grew up with that version. That was the only version I read. Great calm says, and there was a great bonanza. Maybe you guys are too young to remember the show Bonanza. Anybody remember the show Bonanza? It was filmed around here. So I knew what that show meant. Like The hills of New Mexico is beautiful. Bonanza. There's not a lot of bonanza in the show, but that was the name of the show. <laughs> Great bonanza. And then he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? 
See, when I talk to you about Thursdays, in the last two weeks, I've never prayed so hard about God. Give us more church people who can help us. Thursdays, I have to talk to myself and say, don't freak out. Because somebody told me already, we can fix Thursday, Pastor. Just bring half of the kids to come. And I have a hard time with that. I'm going to be honest. I have a hard time as a pastor. I said, tell me to send to tell the people Sunday to come half for the time, but now the kids on Thursday. But I have to listen to myself and say, are you trusting in God? That he's going to give you the people you need. And I'm, and I'm really telling you the truth here. Are you trusting in God? Are you trusting in God? Have you ever had a situation with one of your kids? I have. Where you don't want to talk to them for a while because you're so mad. And all you can do is talk to yourself, pray for yourself, pray for your kid and say, God, I have faith that this is not going to be forever and ever and ever. Have you ever been there? Okay, just, just, just wait. So you have, and then it says, it says, be fearful. Lots of our anger is related. Jesus doesn't even say, calm down, you guys. Take a chill pill. Could he say that? <laughs> now let me defend myself. I care for you. Don't you see that I did a huge miracle here and there is all bonanza and peace now? He doesn't defend himself. He says, he doesn't even say, take a chill pill. Go for a walk. You are too mad right now because medically, and I know that very well, when you get mad, this chemical thing drops in your brain and you get all shaken. You get all mad and it takes 30 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half until the whole. Have you ever experienced that when you get really mad? You know how many people are in jail for the rest of it? I think I said that <laughs> because they don't understand that. And they go and shoot somebody. And this, Jesus says, why are you so fearful? Because a lot of our anger in not being a peacemaker is because <laughs> we are afraid. You're never going to talk to me like that again, honey. Do you hear that? <laughs> Do you, you know, why, why we say that stuff? Because we are afraid that if I don't stop this kid in the truck and slap him in the face and kick him in the back, he's going to come back and be this horrible, disrespectful kid again. So I have to, and so it's fear that gets me so angry. I know I can talk about anger for a long time. I've read books about it. He says, don't be so afraid. Can this world use more peacemaker? Can every family you know, including yourself, can use one or two more peacemaker? Because for a peacemaker, it's better to prevent the pain than to try to cure it after words. God wants to use the wicked in your life to bless you. Psalm 133, verse 1 to 3 says, How wonderful and how beautiful is to see the brethren live in unity. I said 50% of marriages end up in what? In marriages. Is it because they all think the same? No, because unity has nothing to do with thinking the same. Unity has to do with loving that person, yes? <laughs> and so in the end, I'm going to, in the end, and you can, you can look at it. Psalm 133 says, how wonderful, how beautiful, whatever is your translation, it is to see the brethren, the families, people in church live in unity. And at the end of verse 3, keeps talking about the same thing. It says, because there the Lord will send his blessings. And when I see the scripture, I had to ask myself this week, is there blessings that we are be withholding from God's promises? in our homes, in our ministries, in our jobs, in our relationships, 
They're the only reason. It's not that you don't pray enough. It's not that you don't fast enough. It's not that you don't uh, walk enough with God. You don't give enough. You don't serve enough. No. The Bible says in 133, 13, I'm going to send my blessings where there is unity. And unity can only happen in a place where there is peacemaker. Give me two or three guys or ladies in this church who are not peacemaker and put them together in ministry. Sooner or later, they're going to be division and gossip. I'll say this one more time. Give me two or three guys in this church or ladies who are not peacemaker. And they soon will be division and gossip. Okay, I understand, honey, that you got COVID, but I've been doing this ministry by myself, and you are just laying at home coughing, you know, so, and I'm sorry for you, and I'm praying for you, <laughs> but it's become really hard to do this ministry thing during COVID. You, you hear the no peacemaker there? Can you hear him? Because I deserve a vacation myself once in a while. And I can call in sick too. And one of these days, <laughs> you better know it. When I get COVID, I'm not going to go three months to do my ministry in church. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so that's the way that this world operates. But the Bible says they will be called sons and daughters of God. In verse 10... Just right after 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers. 10, Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For there is the kingdom of heaven. Now, being blessed is a little, has a higher price. You need to expect and be ready to deal with people spitting in your face. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my sake. That's what it says, Amen. <laughs> But in the world that we live, in the culture that we live, somebody ever spits in my face or throws me in the mouth, I'll never go back to that church. I'll never go back to that job. I'll never walk into that room again. But Jesus says, if you want to grow in being blessed and more blessed and more blessed and more blessed, I know this guy that you say, how are you doing, brother? Bless, bless, bless. He says, bless, bless. He's blessed. And I'm saying, if you want to be blessed, bless, 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 you have to expect people to throw you in the mouth. How many of oh, you, I'm going to ask something that you know what is coming. How many of you guys want to have all the blessings that God has for your life? All the blessings. <laughs> now everybody's listening the, because you're smart enough. You came to church and you know the questions that I make. Sometimes they have a little trick in there. You know what I'm saying? How many of you guys want all the blessing? How many of you guys want, like, you know, are ready to get the spit in your face? And the betrayal and the knife and the pain and the disrespect and the offense. Wait a little bit. I don't need that many blessings, Pastor. I got enough blessings in my life. Well, Jesus says, let me help you to grow in the blessings. But the more blessed you want to be, the more you have to be like me. Because I didn't got just spit in the face or throw in the mud. I hung on the cross and bleed it and bleed it and bleed it. And all my muscles in a moment were having cramps. That's what produces that liquid on this side of the body. When he, they put the sore on him, and something like water came out. It's because of the pain. A peacemaker has access to his godly father. Did you want your spouse, your kids, your co-workers to say, that is a truly man of God. That is a true woman of God. That is a true son of God. That is a true, true son of God. That is a true, true daughter of God. Some people say that my sons, they walk like me, you know. You can see when a becker is coming, you know. Whatever, I don't know what that means, but they, they say the Becker's boys, they have a way of w walking. I don't know what it means. 
they called me Mamet, you know, in school when I was a little kid. You know, the Mamet is the prehistoric elephant. How you call that? Mamet, Mamut. You got it now. You can call me Mamet. That's okay. <laughs> but they say that my sons they walk like me. I can see the Becker. I can see the Jesus in Oscar. Jesus, I can see the Jesus in Dana because they are peacemakers. They are peacemakers. They are peacemakers. They are peacemakers. And I finish saying this. How many of us want our friends to go to heaven? Can I see your hands? That was an easy question. How many of you guys want your enemies to go to heaven? You know who is the most powerful person to preach to them? You. You. People will say, oh my goodness. That guy, that lady must have something that I don't know how they got it. And they know it's Jesus. Because I keep spitting in their face. So God has called you and me to become the greatest tools to take our enemies to heaven. Because they will come to know Jesus the way you truly, honestly react when they spit in your face. The greatest preaching you can ever do about the Lord is to your enemies. It's easy. The Bible says to love those who love us. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, oh, you spend $50 in a Christmas gift for me. I better at least buy a $25 gift card, you know, because it's easy <laughs> to give 25 The one who gives you 50 it's easy. Would you close your eyes right there where you are this morning? Some of us need to ask ourselves today, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Is there a relationship in your life that you need to bring peace? The gospel is the answer to all the problems of your sons. The gospel is the answer of all the problems to your wife, to your ex-wife, to your son, to your daughters, to your boss. The gospel is the answer to all the problems in this world. And the Lord has chosen you to preach to those who are evil, mean, disrespectful, ugly, unfair, stealing your rights. Because I can tell you, even if it is a million dollars, the soul of your enemy is more valuable, the Bible says, than all the riches of this world. All the riches, all the rights, all the money, all the property, all the houses, all the cars are junk compared to the value of the soul of your enemy. Father God, we close this morning this service. Lord, I know this word is for me and for many in this room, Lord. And all of us want to be Christians. Most of us don't expect to be spit in the face. Most of us are not comfortable when they push us into the dirty mud. Lord, but I ask you that your spirit will work inside of us. The seven beatitudes, perfection, a pure heart, a love for Christ and the gospel higher than the material things that I possess, than my pride and my rights, Lord. Maybe, Lord, today there is a person in this room who needs to give up their rights to see you work a miracle in this prodigal son or daughter, that your Holy Spirit will come and bring them to the senses. Lord, I ask you that you would just please 
work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.